Okay, hello everyone. It's about time to get started here. Thank you everyone for joining today. My name is James Truckle. I'm an applications engineer with Plexum. Uh, and I'm excited today to be discussing the thermal modeling capabilities in Plex. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start by clarifying what the thermal domain is. We're going to dive into its implementation and then discuss how it can be used for things like power loss and efficiency calculations, heat flow and temperature monitoring, cooling network design, and even device reliability analysis. I always like to start these webinars by providing a brief background on our company and a framework for what we are going to discuss today. We will keep the webinar to approximately 30 to 40 minutes um, please feel free to send us questions during the presentation, and we will try to answer them when appropriate or at the end. Keep in mind that while this is a webinar that covers certain topics, others are explored in more detail during uh, specific thermal workshops organized several times a year. Uh, there is also a handout available in the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel. It's called Plex thermal modeling. So feel free to download this. It's a set of comprehensive slides that you can use as reference to this webinar. Our company Plexum is headquartered in Zurich, Switzerland. We also have two offices in the US, one in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and another in Seattle, Washington. Our simulation and test tools have been used by industry and academic institutions for over 15 years. Uh, while our offerings have expanded where we offer more than just a simulation software, the quality of each new innovation conti continues to meet the precedent set forth by Plex. Plex was first developed while our founders were working on a PhD in power electronics at ETH Zurich. They found that the tools available to them at the time uh, lacked a certain functionality needed for fast simulations of power electronics, so they created their own. A Plex block set was released, which immediately gave MATLAB Simulink users a unique power electronics toolbox to use for modeling and simulation. Plex standalone followed several years later which incorporates its own controls library, allowing users to simulate complete systems without needing Simulink. Other offerings are available that support the testing and validation of embedded controls. This includes a real-time simulator capable of performing controller hardware in the loop tests, and it can be also used as a rapid control prototyping platform. Today, we're really going to be focusing on Plex. And one capability that makes Plex unique is incorporating components from multiple physical domains into the modeling environment. The multiple physical domains interface with each other to allow complex and dynamic systems to be simulated with a lot of fidelity. Today, we will be talking about the thermal domain, but magnetic and mechanical domains can also be found in the tool. At its core, Plex was designed to be a very powerful tool for analyzing power electronic system characteristics. A distinct feature that enables fast and efficient simulations is using ideal switches for power semiconductor modeling. Because of high switching frequencies inherent in power electronics, simulating realistic transient behavior is very computationally demanding for power electronic circuits. The waveform on the left of this slide is one that you may find in a, a tool like SPICE or perhaps observe on real hardware. The waveform on the right is what you will find in Plex. Losses are then accounted for using our thermal domain. So this leads me to, to really start talking about this domain and, and what the motivations were behind it 
Uh, and I'd like to talk a bit about these motivations before we show some real simulation results. Uh, in almost all power conversion applications, reducing energy usage and minimizing losses are key goals. And as you will see, the approach taken in Plex allows significant insight into losses early in the design process, which can speed up time to market. You can investigate key trade-offs without having to build working hardware prototypings, sorry, prototypes when thermal measurements can be difficult to make or uh, time consuming to perform accurately. So going further into this thermal domain, uh, before incorporating this feature into your model, it is, important to, it, it is important to really understand how the thermal domain works. So specifically, we will discuss how Plex relates currents flowing through power semiconductors to qualitative measurements like heat flows and temperature calculations. In the bottom left corner of this slide, we can see the blue Plex thermal model shows a heat sink component, a thermal resistance, a temperature source representing the ambient environment. And this is our, our thermal circuit here. Um, the heat sink component is an isothermal layer that functions as a surface of equal temperature. So it absorbs the thermal losses dissipated by the components within its boundaries and propagates its temperature back to the components that it encloses. As a user, we can define its thermal capacitance shown here by the internal cap. And we can monitor the heat that flows from the devices as represented by the internal sources. Specific analogies between the thermal and the electrical domains are shown here in the bottom right corner. And notice the units that are associated with each thermal component. Uh, we can also measure ohmic losses due to the passive components. These can also be captured. Examples include resistors, filters, and winding resistances. The energy injected into the thermal network is equal to the voltage times the current. Okay, so a critical part to utilizing this thermal modeling capability in Plex is learning how to define thermal loss data for semiconductor devices. For every switching component in Plex, you can include a detailed thermal description behind it. The loss description uses lookup table data, which helps maintain the speed advantage you already get in Plex. These 3D tables can be generated using a data sheet, hand calculations, or by taking measurements. An example is shown here on the right-hand side of this slide. The table you see is part of the thermal editor window and includes lookup tables to define turn on losses. There are also other areas to enter data for turn off losses and conduction losses. At the end, we'll be talking more about populating this data as well as where to access pre-existing Plex thermal models for popular devices available in the public domain. How Plex internally uses the lookup tables is actually quite straightforward. During the simulation, Plex uses conditions from the electrical circuit, including blocking voltages, conduction currents, as well as the device's junction temperature to calculate an appropriate loss value from the lookup tables. Switching losses are inserted into the thermal network as energy impulses, while conduction losses are included during the on state. Losses can also be defined as equations, allowing for additional dependencies such as gate drive circuitry, gate voltage and stray inductance values, and by including as much of this known data as possible, the simulated losses can be calculated very accurately 
over a wide operating range. On the slide here, you can see the switching and conduction losses as seen in Plex versus as seen in, in reality. So as previously mentioned, all of the devices sitting on a heat sink component will have the same temperature. As conduction and switching losses are injected into the thermal network, the heat sink's internal temperature will increase. Externally connected thermal networks can be added to show various thermal layers and the transitions within your system. For example, one could include the transitions from a device's junction to its case, the case to a, his, to a physical heat sink, and finally a physical heat sink then to the ambient environment. Hierarchical modeling is used for modeling more complicated thermal structures, such as a, a dual pack IGBT module in this slide. To obtain the junction temperature of an individual component in such a structure, three hierarchical levels are needed. At the bottom level, the junctions are modeled by defining the thermal impedance between each junction and the IGBT plate. At the next level, the thermal plate of the IGBT is modeled the thermal capacitance of the plate and the thermal resistance between the plate and the heat sink can also be defined. The ambient temperature is the temperature of the lower thermal component in the hierarchy. In this case, it would be the heat sink temperature. At the top level, the heat sink itself is modeled. Within the thermal editor, the thermal impedance between the device's junction and case should be specified. Okay, so let's quickly summarize what we've addressed so far in the previous slides. So let's go through what's happening once again in Plex during a simulation. Once your model is fully prepared, meaning your device losses are defined in the thermal editor and your thermal circuit is drawn, you can now run a simulation. The thermal and electrical circuits are solved simultaneously. Specifically, device voltage and current levels are supplied to lookup tables after a switching event, then losses are calculated and injected into the thermal circuit. Temperatures are coupled back to the lookup table in an iterative fashion since these changes influence the losses. Assuming that our loss data is correct, Plex will provide very fast and accurate combined electrical thermal simulation of your power electronics system. My colleague will now uh, deliver the rest of the webinar, so I'll leave it to Chris. Thank you, James. Hi, this is Chris here, also in Seattle, Washington. Um, so at this point, I'm going to uh, show you uh, via some Plex models um, more examples of what we've discussed so far. Um, here you can see a very simple, unrelated, unregulated buck converter, uh, and it does include a basic thermal model. We see that here. Uh, as James mentioned, uh, basically this is in two parts, uh, both at the device and then at the thermal circuit level. So I'm going to start looking at thermal parameters assigned to the IGBT and freewheeling diode. So if I double click here, we get the mass parameters window. And you'll notice, um, as is the case for most of the components in Plex, we're using an idealized switch here. So very different from a SPICE type package with many parameters uh, and modeling more physical behavior. We're turning on and off ideally with optional parameters for vol forward, forward voltage drop and on resistance. In this next tab, the thermal tab here, we can define with a high amount of accuracy, however, the thermal loss information. So if I go to what's already been populated here, drop down menu and choose edit, 
Uh, we see an example set of curves for turn on loss. Um, so this is basically um, using what I would say is uh, information for a device that was maybe rated for such a circuit condition. Um, so this is not related to any particular device, but kind of uh, nominal values for, for such a circuit with 400 volts input. Um, so what I want you to focus on with this set of loss surfaces here is uh, first there's two temperatures that's indicated by the two colors here. Um, but then for a number of blocking voltages and on state currents. So in the case of uh, turn on, we would have the blocking voltage before turn on. And uh, for turn off, we would have the blocking voltage after turn on, turn off rather. And then obviously the on state currents um, after turn on and before turn off. And so all three of these I, V, and T are used as uh, inputs to the thermal lookup. So the same can be said then for turn off loss here, as well as conduction loss, which is simpler 2D profile, where we have basically a set of IV curves for different temperature traces. And then you'll notice at the top, we have several different computation methods. Uh, the first is using a lookup table approach, which we have deployed here. Um, we can also access the data by formula or a combination of the two. Um, so basically the, the default required is, is such as, as you see here, um, but I'll show momentarily in another tab how we could also customize this further. In this next tab, we would then define the thermal impedance information uh, by default as the Cower nef network where we have the physical values for R and C. Alternatively, there's an option as well to specify a foster network where we have uh, basically no relation to any physical meaning, but rather using a curve fitting approach we can define uh, with resistance and time constant values. And then in this next tab, we um, would provide custom variables. So uh, as James mentioned, you might include the gate drive resistance uh, or the gate voltage values, strain inductance and other inputs. Um, we can simply add these in the list and I will come back to this in a further example uh, to demonstrate uh, what that might look like. So I'm gonna close this, actually don't need to modify anything. Um, same thing is basically used uh, in the diode where we have a predefined set of curves just to prove so. Um, turn on loss for diodes is, is negligible. Um, so turn, turn off loss, we see some uh, curves here with kind of the uh, almost saturation or reverse recovery effect uh, can be seen in the behavior there. Uh, a set of on state curves and a thermal impedance as well associated here. So it's important to mention about the thermal impedance within the device, uh, the, the thermal editor for the device is that these basically represent the junction to case information. Um, if we now look out one level, um, we'll see that these are sitting on a common surface here. So this is our Plex heatsink component, uh, but as James mentioned, you really should think of this first and foremost as a, a thermal layer, a surface of equal temperature. Um, so the individual devices have their own thermal impedance associated with them for a junction two case. And so we can actually think of this surface as representing the case for say a combined chopper package, uh, which includes both IGBT and diode. Um, what that means then is we double click on the heat sink. There is an initial temperature of the case of 20 degrees C. Um, we're not defining a thermal capacitance here, but rather connecting to a thermal chain component, in which case we have two discrete RC values, uh, which may represent, for example, the transitions from case to heat sink, and then further the heat sink to ambient. Um, can also have a, an initial temperature associated here as well. Um, typically you might have those match, but it's not really crucial um, if you're running a transient simulation pretty quickly, these will diverge anyhow. Um, and finally, we're using a fixed temperature environment of 25 degrees C. Um, this is a common way of doing this. In addition to these blocks, we have uh, discrete thermal resistor and thermal capacitances that we can include. Um, there's also various blocks for having dynamic 
temperatures uh, with controllable inputs that you can use the control domain to uh, actually uh, influence the behavior of and the value of. Um, we can also have heat flows uh, to mimic cooling, heating and cooling sources in the thermal circuitry as well. So basically with, with all of these, we have the building blocks um, to develop a very detailed thermal model uh, in kind of a 2D fashion. As James mentioned, we have the ability to do hierarchical modeling. So if, for example, uh, there needed to be a dependence between thermal impedance dependence and between the two devices, we could simply have uh, a heat sink just representing or, or just covering rather the IGPT and a separate one for the diode. Um, for the purpose of this simulation, though, I'm going to leave everything as the default. Uh, there is one more thing I want to talk about uh, before doing so. So we return to the slides, um, and I want to quickly talk about measuring the losses. So obviously, um, we now have a buck converter uh, modeled in the electrical space, but then in addition, we have thermal descriptions associated with the two act with the two switches and then further the thermal circuitry built around that. Um, what we see here in this slide though is that we can easily measure and visualize the power losses uh, for efficiency calculations, for example, using the Plex probe and uh, these built-in averaging blocks. So at the top, we're kind of showing what's happening where the, the conduction losses are applied during the on-state as basically pulses of power and uh, the switching losses are energy impulses at each turn on and turn off event. We do have two separate blocks that are used um, to do the averaging of these, uh, and I'll show that in just a second, where the IGBT probe will um, pull out then the conduction and switching losses, and then we can look at the basically average over each switching interval. So we can then calculate the total power loss of a single device, a number of devices or even an entire power stage. All right, so let's put everything together um, that we've discussed and view some results in our model. Um, I am going to go to the simulation menu and click start here. Uh, we'll see in the top plot, we have uh, waveforms for load voltage and source current as seen by the voltmeter and amp meter here. Um, we see that electrically we have uh, basically uh, a quick transient to reach the steady state operating conditions, um, but thermally we, we have a much slower uh, time constant, you would say, due to obviously the, the heating of the, the circuit uh, here. So we'll look into that in a bit of detail in a second, um, but I'll hop into the Plex probe um, we see that there's actually associated signals by default for any IGBT, but actually for that, per, for the, um, while I mentioned that really any component in Plex has a number of signals associated with, with it that can be probed. Um, so we could look at the junction temperature, but in this case we're interested in the conduction and switching losses. This buck converter is switching at 10 kilohertz. And therefore, if we click on the averaging block for the conduction losses, we see here that um, that is reflected by the uh, 100 milliseconds interval as well in this block again. So um, one way to think about this is uh, this pickoff point here, we are summing basically the total losses from the IGBT that are averaged over any conduction interval the same for the diode, and then finally the, the full losses uh, from the two. That is shown then in this plot here, where we are comparing uh, actually two waveforms. The first, the heat flow meter, that's the green signal here. So starting at zero, um, and that settles about 300 watts. Uh, and then the red curve is from the summation of the two. Again, settling at about 300 watts. Uh, the reason being that there is a difference, the green curve as associated with this watt meter or heat flow meter. Uh, there is a obviously a thermal capacitance associated with this network, uh, which therefore sees the slower time constant to reach steady state. Um, so here is, is a way of observing then the um, Total power loss, uh, we could also use um, what is a display block here to, to monitor the magnitude of these. 
Um, in the second plot, you can also take a look at a couple waveforms, um, seeing the junction temperatures separately for IGBT and diode, as well as heat sink. Again, remember that this is representing the case. And if I zoom in, perhaps uh, maybe during the rise, it'd be interesting to capture a couple of waveforms. Again, 10 kilohertz switching, so I have to zoom in to a very small interval here. And what we'll actually find is that there's a turn on event in the IGBT, and then associated with that is a temperature rise. Um, and then during the conduction state, we'll further increase. And then in the turn off event, we have another jump in temperature associated with that loss. And then in the off state, we'll see a cooling. And obviously, um, in addition to these localized events, if we zoom back out, there is a continuous heating uh, over time. And that's because basically as uh, the junction itself and the case heats up, the losses fed back to the temperature dependent lookup tables will be influenced by that increasing heating. So the more this heats up, the, the higher the losses get. Uh, and that's um, fed back to itself. One more thing I wanted to show in this model here. So this probe here, we're looking at the voltage source power of the DC side. We're also averaging that over the switching interval. And we're basically just doing a simple uh, formula here with the function block of 100% minus the switching power uh, as, as summed by these uh, diode and IGBT calculations uh, over the input power. So you can see that here again, um, and then multiplying that by 100 to get a percentage, and we see that uh, in more or less steady state, we're at an efficiency of about 97.5%. This is not taking into account um, source impedance or any ohmic losses in the system. Um, we could definitely include those uh, with physical parameters or electrical parameters rather in the devices. Um, there may be questions as well about um, magnetic losses. So we do have a separate magnetic domain, which we will not speak to in this discussion today, but there is a magnetic resistance block as well as a hysteretic core block where each time a major and minor loop is closed, uh, both of these can be uh, used with the Plex probe to calculate the losses. Further, if I had um, ESR of a cap or uh, the series impedance of the inductor here, or even the load, for example, any any components that I capture within the borders of this heat sink can actually be used uh, for the loss and, and heating calculations. So keep in mind that we're really just showing in this demo model the switching cell, um, but ohmic losses uh, as well can also be monitored. All right, so one of the things um, that we noticed here is that uh, we have kind of a, a slower time constant thermally. Uh, the same can often be said with perhaps uh, including mechanical domains, uh, but this is where Plex is very powerful with mixed mode simulation and mixed domain simulation where we might actually have lots of different things happening at once. Um, but of course, electrically, typically we see the fastest transients and time constants. So I'm gonna return to the slides here um, I'm going to introduce then our steady state analysis. Uh, so this is a tool that's built in and very efficiently and very quickly can computate the steady state operating uh, states on your system. So this can include electrical waveforms, uh, but may also uh, very nicely calculate the steady state operating temperatures or losses. Um, so this is accessed from the simulation menu and I will actually show that with this demonstration now. Um, so let's um, maybe use the IGBT as an example. So after five second simulation time, we have a final operating junction temperature of around 120 degrees C. Um, can verify that here by turning on the cursors and pulling that out later in time, and we do see that is the case. Let's say we had a much more uh, complicated circuit here, maybe have many more components, and we want to more easily or more quickly realize the um, steady state information. So we go to the simulation menu, analysis tools. Um, we've pre-specified for this demo model a steady state analysis. Um, just to add a new one here, you click the plus button, 
And know that there are some additional tools built into Plex, mostly to do with uh, control design and analysis, stability analysis. Um, but we'll stick with the steady state for this um, today. And what I should mention here is basically um, this is primarily used for periodic systems. Can also be used for passive networks. Um, but the uh, for switching systems, there's a requirement of periodicity here. Uh, in this case, we will leave this as the default of auto, and uh, the Plex solver will actually detect that there is a switching frequency of 10 kilohertz that it uses as the system period. Um, in the options tab, I won't go through everything here today, but basically the termination tolerance is the main setting the user defines uh, to tune the accuracy of the results, or really how the, uh, the engine knows that the system reaches steady state between any two consecutive cycles that has to be within a certain tolerance to to uh, terminate the simulation to to deem it at a steady state. Um, so finally, before I click go, I'll, I'll just mention that we're showing five steady state cycles. So if I start the analysis here, within just a second or two, uh, we are able to cap cap capture some waveforms. And basically, we can see for a switching cycle here, um, we have five of these. We can look at the uh, ripples in the temperature behavior as due to the switching. Uh, also electrically, we see some waveforms here as well. And then we can even look in the uh, loss calculations and see that we're a little north of 300 watts um, in the switching cell in the steady state. Um, all right, uh, so this kind of, uh, this is a demo built into Plex. Uh, I should mention how to access that. If we go to the window menu, demo models, um, we can then toggle by uh, thermal here, and there are several different examples built in. Um, I just grabbed the first one here, buck converter with thermal model, and um, here's some documentation, uh, and we describe basically everything that I've just shown here. Um, okay, so common question then that James uh, did preview earlier is how do we obtain switching loss data for lookup tables? So everything I showed uh, makes for nice demonstration, but obviously um, our users will, will want to actually get the data into the, the model and, and be able to do everything I just said um, with, with some custom devices. So the first approach, uh, and, and certainly um, the preferred one, if you have the ability to do so, is to take experimental, experimental measurements. Um, the reason being is that uh, switching losses, for example, are, are very dependent not just on the device itself, but the physical system in which these devices sit. Uh, so greatly influenced um, by such things as uh, drive circuitry and board layout, um, which may not easily be captured uh, simply with the data sheet information. Um, so if it's possible to perform experimental measurements to determine switching losses, again, this is ideal. Uh, but of course, it's not always easily readily done in many cases, and we often have, uh, and, and often we, we really use a model to inform our hardware design rather than the other way around. Uh, so in a second option, when this first one is not possible, we require the manufacturers themselves to provide sufficient information in data sheets. Um, which usually can rep be represented, uh, which usually would then represent the average performance of a device over its lifetime. I will show an example data sheet momentarily and walk through some of the relevant plots uh, for a thermal description that I actually built up in Plex. Um, but uh, this, this is a very strong approach. Um, in the attached documentation, there's a PDF file attached here. We actually give some recommended um, suggestions on how to extrapolate um, basically nominal values and, and how to use certain uh, waveforms and plots given in data sheets to build the complete data set for Plex. And a final but potentially more convenient option, um, we have established partnerships with several leading semiconductor manufacturers where they actually develop thermal description Device, uh, files for their devices directly for use in Plex. Um, so a list of some of the companies doing so is shown here at the bottom. Um, having said that, if you have questions about a specific device, device or component, we encourage you to contact the manufacturer directly. You can always as well ask us for advice. Um, 
<clears throat> okay, going back to Plex, I'm going to close this model. And I'm going to open up a uh, simple test circuit here. Um, basically, uh, this is just to verify operation and get a, a couple of waveforms. So it's a um, 400 volt DC input source. Um, we have a MOSFET here uh, where I've actually plugged in a thermal description. Um, so before running the model, I'm actually going to um, show the data sheet for that. So this is a United Silicon Carbide uh, CAS code MOSFET, JFET, and um, part number is available here, but basically it's a uh, 600 volt in vice um, RDS on of 80 milliohms. And um, let's see, the uh, current rating is, um, is available here. Um, so this is a uh, publicly available device that they sell, and, and I just pulled the data sheet off their website. Um, so I'm going to go through a set of uh, tables showing various ratings and specs. Um, at the very top, we, we show maximum and typical ratings. So there are a few parameters uh, that may be useful here. Um, these are fairly similar across data sheets. I think it's typically... Uh, the plots where, where people um, may have some questions. So um, I'm going to hang out here in figures one, two, and three. Uh, these are very valuable for us. Um, so I won't go through kind of every detail, but um, basically here we, we're looking at the, uh, the, the typical output characteristics. So we see the drain current versus drain source voltage, um, also known as IV conduction curves. And uh, what's important here is that these are for three different operating temperatures, negative 55, 25, and 175 C. So probably typical operation somewhere in between these. Um, but the important thing is having at least two temperatures will give us uh, some dependency of temperature on the losses. Um, what I usually do is then uh, grab the curve of the highest uh, gate voltage, um, but for certain applications, the user may obviously uh, choose a, a different gate voltage value and, and therefore the, the curves um, reflected here for those. Uh, but I simply followed uh, this dotted line here at the top and um, would capture, for example, one way to do it, uh, maybe at zero uh, volts and zero amps, but then um, further at uh, 10 amps, at 20 amps, 30 amps, uh, and in increments of 10 like so, you would basically uh, eyeball, or if you're zooming in, or there's some curb, curve extraction tools publicly available, you would just simply uh, pull some data points off of this curve and um, simply enter it directly into the Plex interface that we've shown. And again, um, the more data that you can provide, the higher resolution the loss information will be during the live simulation. So certainly uh, the more data that you can uh, insert, the better in that case. All right, uh, going further down um, the table then, we will see that there are a few more curves um, here for third quadrant operation. Um, so again, the three temperatures are, are just shown here. Uh, so if you want to have um, reverse biasing in uh, in the case of the MOSFET uh, for that little uh, for that little test circuit I just showed, that actually wouldn't be the case here. But for uh, AC converters, this might be quite relevant. Um, so here we would be able to, from these uh, three curves, uh, extract that information. Further down, we have a plot um, for switching energy. Let's see. Uh, here, switching energy versus drain current, figure 18. Um, and uh, this is for a given junction temperature and blocking voltage. So we see for 400 volts, which is kind of a, a common operating point. Um, we do also see this is for 150 degrees C. Uh, so this is a single temperature at which this uh, E-on and E-off curves are provided. So that in itself is, is maybe a little bit limiting, um, but actually on the next page, in figure 21, we actually have uh, switching energy versus temperature. So this plot provides us, so the combination of these two, we have uh, quite a bit of information for switching loss measurements uh, with temperature dependence. Um, finally, to include more insight into the loss behavior based on the design selection of gate resistance,
turn on energy based on the gate drive on resistance and turn off energy based on the gate drive off resistance. Um, so here we could actually use uh, custom additional parameters to, uh, to include these dependencies here. There's also a set of uh, transient thermal impedance curves in figure 16. Um, often data sheets will do this in, in different ways. Um, sometimes they'll actually give uh, Foster or, or Cower uh, values directly um, or a set of curves. Um, but a simple approach uh, with a plot like this, uh, I can show here if I zoom in. Uh, we see that the R value um, is in a logarithmic scale about uh, 0.68 ohms. And uh, if we then look at a uh, basically 63%, um, that is going to give us the time constant uh, value um, 0.46. And then we come down here and we can actually look at tau. And from there, we can calculate the value for C given a uh, first order um, time constant. So we would have C and R. Uh, so this is uh, basically um, available as well. If I hop back to uh, the Plex model then, I can click on edit. Um, and everything I've just mentioned or highlighted in the, the plots, um, I've actually used directly here. So uh, two voltage values, a set of on state um, currents, a uh, number of temperatures. So in this case, I actually did some uh, linear interpolation. Um, we have a set of turnoff losses, similar fashion, and uh, conduction losses, which were easily provided as well. Now, the thermal impedance then from the MOSFET, uh, I mentioned I had the R value and the tau value. In the Foster network, um, we could also provide uh, Cower network information. Um, and then finally, I included the gate turn on and turn off resistance um, as RG on and RG off. So these are custom variables. And um, the recommended uh, operating ranges for those by the manufacturer. So now if we hop back to the uh, loss tables in the first three tabs, we will actually see the computation method includes um, basically the loss table using traditional current voltage and temperature inputs, <clears throat> excuse me, but here with a, an additional dependence on RG on and RG off. So uh, by simply placing these in the list in the variables tab, I now have access to these. Um, and using basically, I added um, the dependence for those in, in these uh, waveforms just using a curve fitting approach. So I just basically uh, got the trend line from an Excel spreadsheet and added those here. Um, in doing so, I then have access directly to the mask parameters at the top level um, and I'm using common values. You'll see that I get uh, some waveforms. Um, we can look at junction temperature and we find that conduction loss is uh, 10 and a half watts, uh, or sorry, 15 watts. Switching loss is one watt. Um, obviously for uh, silicon carbide, we would be switching much faster and then for power conversion in general. So maybe if you look at 10 kilohertz, we would expect our switching losses to increase. Um, okay, that's uh, something's not right there. Probably yes, need to change the averaging interval, but um, you get the idea. So built up a simple test circuit here just to, to be able to quickly get um, some magnitude information. I've been told I may be having some audio issues, but I'm going to keep chugging through. And if I need to answer any questions at the end and go back, I'm happy to do so. Um, okay. So here we have a uh, wolf speed. Um, Cree company, they make uh, silicon carbide devices and um, going to their homepage. And I just wanted to highlight that um, they do have a very nice design simulator called SpeedFit built in. Uh, if you enter your email address and affiliation, you can access it and basically allows for the online simulation and selection and testing of their devices. Uh, it's been designed in conjunction with Plexum uh, and actually uses the Plex engine under the hood. 
Um, so that might be a way to, to test some of their devices uh, and actually uh, pick one out for your application. Uh, but if you then go to the documents, tools, and support page, wanted to make you aware uh, that you can actually download directly Spice and Plex model files. Um, so here you would just again need to provide your information uh, and then in the next page you would have access uh, to the full set of device models for Plex for download. I did uh, grab one of those from their web page and um, as another option here I can show a MOSFET from Cree. Um, you can see the, the data that they've developed here. And then if I go to custom variables, there is an external gate resistance uh, parameter that is uh, added as a custom tunable parameter. So the user would be required to provide something, I believe for this part, the nominal value is 2.5 ohms. Um, so then if I run a simulation here, again, oh, so Plex Sanilo is notifying me that I need to change uh, the solver type to stiff which is a fun topic in itself, but unfortunately outside the scope of today's chat. Um, so I'll switch. Waveforms here. Um, so there you go. Uh, that's uh, kind of a, a third approach to um, accessing the thermal models for Plex is to find them on uh, your favorite manufacturer's websites. Um, a couple topics we didn't discuss then is uh, advanced things such as active cooling. So again, rather than a fixed uh, temperature environment here, we might have a uh, controlled heat flow or controlled temperature block um, where the input is done. And we may have in between a set of uh, uh, a logic, we may have um, an equation that we implement or a uh, lookup table approach to uh, include the logic for cooling. We've also done some work in device reliability analysis internally. Um, so this would include uh, kind of a, a typical rain flow analysis approach. So if you get the cycle by cycle uh, events of a switch, um, we can extrapolate that to, to look at the uh, lifetime of a device. Um, so these are, again, a bit more complicated. If anyone has questions on these, we encourage you to uh, contact us directly. So if there's anything today that you saw interest in and want to learn more about, it um, would be great if you reached out to us by email. You can do so at info at plexum.com. And so I hope that everyone uh, can take something from today's webinar and apply them to their own Plex simulations. Um, and I'm going to then uh, give everyone a minute or two to uh, provide some questions. All right, so we had a question. Um, I, I showed a silicon carbide device. Um, someone asked if we had done any work with gallium nitride or GAN devices. Um, actually, we have partnered as well with um, a couple companies, but uh, one being GAN Systems. And if you go on their website, they, they also have a number of um, circuit models built into their website uh, that use uh, Plex Engine as a background and you can contact them directly to access the thermal description. So if you go to the design center and circuit simulation tools, they have a number of topologies that have uh, been built upon Plex. And uh, again, they make the components available to you uh, if you request them. There's another question here about uh, calculating the internal body diode of MOSFETs. So as I've kind of said all along, we, we have basically the, uh, the building blocks here. Um, so depending on a specific device, uh, you can model this as basically a uh, discrete MOSFET and separate uh, diode, um, I guess at the top here. That can be truly the, the body diode, or it could actually be an external diode, Schottky diode, for example. We can also have uh, a package component here. Basically, with integrated anti-parallel diode, it's the same functionality. Uh, there are a couple nuances here. If I go to the help, um, and actually if I go to, uh, let's see, thermal modeling, there is a tab on the thermal description 
where uh, thermal editor, we talk exactly about what I'm mentioning here. Um, here it is. Okay, so if you have a discrete diode, you need to be um, just aware of basically the polarity. So you can model uh, for the switch and the anti-parallel diode, um, the third quadrant uh, conduction information. If you use the integrated switch with diode components, you just need to be aware of the polarities for the diode conduction losses. So again, this is information available in the online help built into Plex. Um, but uh, yeah, there are ways to to uh, handle current sharing in a body diode, as well as the, uh, for example, the the FET channel in in reverse conduction mode. You can include um, external shocky diodes um, that may share the majority of the current, for example. Uh, there's lots of ways to do it. And as always, if you have specific questions, please please reach out and we'd be happy to, to help with those. Um, there's another question then about calculating efficiency. And um, I did show that in the previous model. So this is a, uh, a thermal model, again, available in Plex. Um, so this is not the only way to do it, but but certainly kind of the easiest and most accurate. So um, you would sum the total losses of the devices of interest and uh, perhaps some additional ohmic losses if you want. Um, you would then divide by the uh, total losses over the input power, subtracting that from 100%. So again, this is built into a demo model available in Plex. I did get a final question about um, modeling magnetic losses of transformers and inductors. So that's kind of a separate topic today, um, but I will mention um, again that uh, in the magnetic domain, we have a resistance and a hysteretic core block. Uh, there are a few demo models. If you filter to um, magnetics that uh, take advantage of these components. Um, so please investigate those. Uh, we do also have a set of uh, tutorial materials uh, related to getting started with the magnetic domain that may be of use. So uh, if, if Mr. Kumar, you wanna reach out to us with any specific questions, we'd be happy to, to help you with that. All right. Then uh, again, thank you all very much. And um, look out for an email from us with a short survey uh, where you can provide feedback on um, how the webinar went and if you have any suggestions for us, which we greatly appreciate, as well as a link for the uh, video to download uh, the recording. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.